one of the things I omitted to have you do earlier was I typically ask you to uh, take the notebooks on the outsides of the pews and register your attendance. So if you're one of those who have not done that yet, that would be good. I thought of saying that before the offering, and I had visions of somebody signing a book and flipping the offering plates all over, and, and I thought, no, we don't want to do that, cause a, a chaotic scene. Uh, you don't want that, I know. We've been going through um, some steps of prophecy, and I'm giving you my understanding. There's obviously other people look at things differently, and they're allowed to do that. Um, and I'm telling you just how I see things in Scripture and, and the best that I can possibly do. Today, we're, uh, we're going to talk about the kingdom, and, and eventually a kingdom's going to come. Christ is going to rule, and uh, that has been part of his plan for a long, long time. I think you'll see that maybe even from the very beginning, uh, he's always wanted to have this earthly rule. There's a couple ways that it's described in Scripture. There's um, the universal kingdom that we talk about, and that's basically uh, all of God's children, his people, from the beginning to the end, and it, it's, it goes all around the world. It goes all throughout time. Uh, that's pretty normal. And sometimes you'll see Jesus uh, or one of the other uh, apostles or, or one of the Scripture writers um, use phrases like the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Those are often interchangeable, but um, sometimes they may be speaking about just that universal kingdom that we can all be a part of. But there's also another aspect called the mediatorial kingdom. And the universal kingdom is, you know, that far extent. It's the rule, the time, the space, all over the place. Mediatorial is more of a method of a rule. It's specific. Um, it has an adequate authority, there's subjects to be ruled, and there's an actual exercise of rulership. That's the kingdom I'm thinking about, the one that the um, Israelites were looking for, the one that was going to be here on earth, and uh, they're going to um, lead and, and guide in that. We have a time chart that we've been going through, and uh, I think I've told you that I think we're right around here somewhere, right before um, the coming of Christ, the rapture, uh, the snatching away of the church. That's where I think we are today. I, I don't know how far out we are. I know that next on the, the big prophetic calendar um, is the Mayan calendar of December 21st, or is that the pathetic calendar? I forget which, but it's on one of those calendars that's supposed to come. But we understand scripture to say that Christians and the church are, uh, are going to be snatched away, and that'll be what's called the rapture there, followed by um, scriptures give a, a description of a horrible time, a seven-year time period that I suggest is for a couple purposes. One is to, to deal with sin, uh, but particularly to prepare Israel to come and understand and recognize the Messiah. And uh, that's going to happen. At the end of the seven-year period, there's going to be several things that take place. The Battle of Armageddon, a very uh, horrible, horrible time for the world's uh, population. The judgment of the sheep and goat nations has to do with how they um, dealt with the believers and with the Messiah. And then the, um, the return, all that's like instantaneous kind of stuff. But the actual uh, setting his feet upon the Mount of Olives, that Christ will come at the end of that time. If you read in Daniel chapter 12, uh, it turns out there's about a 40, 43 day time period that takes place from the end of the, uh, when Christ returns to the end of the Battle of Armageddon. And then we go into a, another time, a kingdom time. And this is uh, what we would call the thousand year millennium, the kingdom, the, the ruling of Christ on earth. So um, that's to come. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today. Now, I did want to say something about this coming Tuesday. Tuesday is going to be a humongously important, critical uh, significant day. It is our men's lunch out, and we're going to Marie's on Tuesday, and uh, that's there in Wadsworth. So it is actually really, really a big day. 
Um, obviously, there's some other things going on on Tuesday, too. Uh, the election is taking place. And uh, you'll be very happy to know that I had a pollster call last night, and I made the fatal mistake of answering the phone. And um, now that's only one out. By the way, I concluded that, and you're in the same boat, all of these phone calls, all of the, they're just reminding us of how very, very important we are. Isn't that nice? You are very, very important. I don't know about in Indiana, but in Ohio, we get hundreds of them a day, and uh, they all want to know. Well, anyhow, this young lady got on, and I apologize to the Sunday school class, but I told them about it. But uh, she, I answered her phone, and she says, I'm so-and-so from yada yada something. Uh, if you're voting on Tuesday, are you going to vote for Obama or Romney? And I said, well, I've already voted. So did you vote for, which one did you vote for, she says. Yeah, personally, I wanted to explain to her that that was none of her business. And, um, and I said, I voted for one of those two. She said, I'll put you down for undecided, click. <laughs> so apparently I gave the wrong answer or something, but I, I can tell you I was not undecided. Um, let me just say several things, and I'm going to give you some really neat quotes if you want them, I can make copies. It's not a problem. Um, you can have that. But I do want to say one thing because everybody is just like, you know, on edge, amped up about the election. And, and I understand why. I don't know if this is you, but I do wish that some Christians would be as energetic about getting people into the kingdom of heaven as they are as to who they get into public office or even the Oval Office. Uh, far more significant is eternity than the next four years. And by the way, when Tuesday is over and you wake up on Wednesday, Jesus Christ is still king. <laughs> it doesn't matter who in the world we vote for. I mean, it does matter. And I'm going to show you quotes that I think are going to point you in a, a very solid direction on, on how we should look at elections. but. Um, Christ is king, Christ is Lord, and, and he should be of our lives. And if we, not, not just us in this room, but we as believers, if everybody in the Gallup poll who says there's Christians would live as though Christ were king, we wouldn't be having some of the issues that we're having uh, in, in the election things. Here's a quote from um, President James Garfield. The people are responsible for the character of her Congress. Now, you don't have this next part. It says this. If that body of, um, okay, let me put my glasses on so I read it properly. It says, if that body be ignorant, we're talking about the Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it's because the people demand these high qualities. Then I continue up there. If the next centennial does not find us a great nation, it will be because those who re represent the enterprise, the culture, and the morality of the nation do not aid in controlling the political forces. What President Garfield was saying was, and by the way, he was a pastor as well, uh, is that it is our responsibility to put good, honest, moral people in the office, whatever office it is. If it's the Humane Society or if it's the Oval Office, that's our responsibility. If we don't take that seriously, if we don't do that, then it's not their fault. If we put the, the reckless and the ignorant and the corrupt person in office, that's, that's our doing. We've done that. So that's, uh, that's a pretty good quote that uh, the former president from down around the other uh, area, Canton, um, has said. Here's what John Jay said. Providence, that's God, has given to our people the choice of the rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Now that's John Jay. He was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. What does he have to say about separation of church and state? <laughs> he says it's our duty and privilege that we should and must put Christians in office. 
I agree with them. Here's what Charles Finley, Finney said. The time has come that Christians must vote for honest men and take consistent ground in politics or the Lord will curse them. Christians have been exceedingly guilty in this matter, but the time has come when they must act differently. God will bless or curse this nation according to the course Christians take. That's kind of interesting. I thought he said that last week. <laughs> um, by the way, it tells you there that he was a uh, revivalist, and, and we can go on forever about some of the revivals that he was involved in. He was a college uh, president. He was president at Princeton at one time, but I know all of you know that he ended up his career as president of Oberlin, uh, up in Oberlin. So uh, that's kind of a neat thing. I've always liked him because of that. I don't have it with me. I know all of you have seen it. But uh, a week ago in the Daily Record, it was printed on the back page of one of the sections. But Billy Graham had supposedly, I don't know if he released it or somebody in his organization, released a very, very uh, great thing that basically comes down to, says that you need to vote biblical principles. If it has to do with um, you know, proper biblical principles of marriage, proper biblical principles of life and sanctity of life, and um, you know, just a, a number of other things as well. And to me, at least in some of the higher offices, that makes it really easy and really clear because there is a huge difference as to what people are doing and what they stand for. I, I like this one. Uh, this is John Wesley. This, this, he said this in, in 1774. He says that uh, he met with the society of those from his uh, group of people um, who had votes in the upcoming election. And here's how he advised them. Number one, he said to them, to vote without fee or reward for the person they judged most worthy. And that's kind of interesting because I think I can't go back to 1774, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he was saying when it was about rewards, it was like, don't vote according, do not vote just because this guy might get you something. Vote for what is the right person. Um, vote for uh, the one who is most worthy. And then, this is important for you and I to catch. Speak no evil, the person that you voted against. That's really important too. I mean, we need to be honorable in, in our dealings with people as well. And then, uh, to take care that their spirits were not sharpened against those that voted on the other side. You know what, not everybody agrees. And there's different reasons why. I mean, you know, someone would not be a candidate for any office if they were just totally 100% corrupt and evil and bad and never did anything good in their life. I, I mean, those, that person, I don't know who that person could be, but they wouldn't be up. There's gotta be some slight thing that makes them a little bit attractive to others. And so, um, you know, there's reasons why people side one way or another, and we don't always know the, the reasons. And so we need to be gracious. That's the main thing it's saying. But uh, we need to vote very strongly um, for those who stand for what is right and true. So I'm, I'm glad we, we were able to do it. That was so much, oh yeah, I forgot I had a quote from, uh, my good friend Martin Luther here. Um, he says, and I'm going to have to read that off the board because it didn't come through in my notes. Uh, if you see, this has to do with Christians getting involved in things. Um, if you see that there is a lack of hangmen, okay, uh, executioners, I guess, constables, judges, lords, or princes, and you find that you are qualified you should offer your services and seek that position. Should Christians get involved? Yeah, uh, that's what he's saying to us. It's kind of interesting because I do hear categories of people that say, well, I don't think I'm gonna vote. 
I don't have all the reasons or, or all that, but um, I saw something written about a week or two ago that there's a lot of young people that are saying they're not going to vote. And one of the reasons given was because they didn't think um, that anybody was listening to them. Here's something I will guarantee that if you're a, if you're uh, emblematic of a group of people that decide not to vote, no one will listen to you. <laughs> they will not listen to you until you say, you know what, I'm going to go vote, and I'm not going to vote for you unless you start listening to me. That's one category. Uh, some don't like to vote because of jury duty. Really? Okay, I don't know what else to say about that. Um, some think that their vote doesn't make a difference, but that's not accurate. There's lots of times. One time, about probably 20 years ago, I had a list of all the different um, things, elections and things that were one by one vote. And the only two I can remember about was, believe it or not, this was not a localized thing. The mayor of Burbank, Ohio was one by one vote one. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, I thought it was a gray horse that Ann used to own, but anyhow. Um, and supposedly Hitler was voted in by one vote. I don't make connections between Burbank and Hitler. No, no, not doing that. We're not going to bring in the kingdom of God according to our votes. We're not going to bring in the kingdom of God even according to your beliefs. Um, God has a timetable, and he's going to do what is right and what is best, and, and it will be according to what he determines. There, I have in your, in your outline a list of the promises. These are kind of interesting. Some of these promises were fulfilled partially, but they're not going to be fully fulfilled until Jesus Christ comes and establishes his kingdom. For instance, in Genesis chapter 1, Adam was promised a kingdom. He was told to have dominion over the earth, subdue the earth. He was supposed to rule it. Now, he got to name animals and all that kind of cool stuff, but uh, it never came up. It was okay until sin came in. Abraham in, in Genesis 12 and also in Genesis 17 was promised that he was going to be a great nation. He was going to be the father of many and his kingdom, his people were going to be as vast as the sands on the sea and as many as the stars in the sky. And I know we think we can count them, but we can't. We just, we can't, we're not smart enough to, to do that kind of stuff. But that was God's promise to him. And he also told Abraham that for the people who bless you, I will bless. And for the people who curse you, I will curse. That is and has been one of the driving foreign policy statements for the United States of America since the very beginning. That is one reason that we have such a high support and, and relationship with Israel because God has promised blessing for those who bless them. And I think God has blessed the United States of America partially because of that position that we've had. Moses uh, was told in Exodus chapter 3, also in Exodus chapter 11, that he was going to be able to take these people into a promised land and that God was going to establish their borders for them. Joshua chapter 1 uh, he, in verse 4, he was told that the boundaries of his territory were going to be everywhere where he steps. Wherever he goes, that's what the land God was going to give. Uh, and King David in 2 Samuel 7 was um, told that his offspring would be the ones who benefit from the kingdom and that it would endure forever. We just sang a song about that. David's son, Solomon, uh, was promised that even with all of his faults, that he was going to be one of those who could rule in this kingdom and that God will always love him. And of course, his greater son, Jesus, was going to be the one who uh, would rule and reign in this particular kingdom. The Bible tells us that uh, the kingdom is going to be a thousand years in length. And you can say, well, you know, I know people who say that, no, that's not a literal thing. It's a spiritual kingdom. There's some that say, well, it, it may not even happen. But some say, well, it's just sort of a, a spiritual kingdom. It's between me and God and my heart. And I'm going to say that I think it's at a literal 1,000-year reign. Why do I say that? When I was in seminary, I remember Dr. Charles Ryrie came to our seminary 
Uh, he was president of Dallas Theological Seminary at that time. And for whatever reason, he was in a class with us and we started talking and about different things. And as very typical of people who are not Grace Brethren or close to us, he brought up uh, John, thir John 13, and he was saying reasons why he doesn't think that's something that should be practiced. John 13 is, is where we get the love feast, the feet, feet washing, and the bread of the cup. And Gary Berlin, a Baptist from Pearson, Indiana, started questioning him and said to him, well, why don't you accept this? And they went back and forth, and finally Dr. Ryrie said, well, and besides, here in John 13 is the only place where Jesus says to do this. And, John, uh, and Gary Berlin leaned forward in his bib overalls and he says, yeah, but how many times does Jesus have to tell us to do something before we do? Good point. So I'm going to suggest, um, is this a literal thousand years? Well, here's what I see in, in Revelation chapter 20. At the end of verse, uh, verse 2, it's talking about the time period when Satan's going to be bound, and it says bound him for a thousand years. Then I jump down to verse 3, and it says to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years are up. And now I'm down in verse uh, 7, I think it is. Um, actually, it's the end of verse 4, and he says about the beast and all that stuff, and they came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years, the resurrection. In verse 5, um, the rest of the dead did not come until the end of the thousand years. And then I'm going to turn my page, and uh, the end of verse 6, where it says, God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. In verse 7, when a thousand years are you get the point, six times it refers to this period as being a thousand years. I'm not very smart, but I'm guessing it's going to last a thousand years. That's just where I'm coming from. And I think um, that's what the Bible teaches, that this kingdom, this earthly kingdom, is going to be a thousand years. It's the one that God had promised Israel that they would have and rule over, and it's the one that we as believers are looking forward to as well. In the end, this is the kingdom that was promised to Adam and Abraham and David. Uh, it's going to be an earthly rule, and I believe it's going to be made up of righteous Jews. These are the Jewish people who made it through the tribulation period, and they're getting ready, to, and they go into, in their, in their human bodies, they're going to go into the millennial kingdom. It's going to be made up of Gentile followers of the Messiah. During the tribulation period, some Gentiles are going to get saved as well. And, and they're going to be allowed. They're going to go through the judgment and then go into uh, the kingdom. And they're going to go in in their human, normal bodies, um, just like the righteous Jews are going to do. And by the way, uh, Isaiah talks about how they will propagate during that time. They will have children. Uh, probably even have parent dedications, who knows, and they're going to um, populate the, the world some, and of course, because they're going to live through that thousand years, and um, they're going to be able to have children, and it's also going to include resurrected Jews. That's going to be an interesting population, because there's going to be King David, and Solomon, and Moses, and Adam, and Abraham and all those who are of the Jewish economy, all of those are going to be there. The big burning question then is, well, what about us? Where are we going to be? Uh, we're the church, and we had already been raptured, and so um, we're going to be with Jesus. And as I read through things like Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46, 48, um, I know that here in Revelation 20, it talks about us ruling and reigning with Christ for that thousand years. And that's what we're going to do. But I see Christ and Ezekiel popping in and out of heaven and in and out of the temple to receive worship in Jerusalem. And so my point would be, we're going to be where Jesus is. We're going to go where he goes. If he goes to heaven, we're going to go into heaven with him. If, we're in, if he's in the temple receiving worship and, and enjoying his people there, we're going to be with him there. Children are going to be born during this time, and they're going to need salvation. Um, but they're going to live in a near perfect society. Now, I know you think that's where we're at today, but not quite. Uh, and I say that that will be a near perfect society because even with the presence of Jesus there, visible, worshiping him, 
And with all that going on, there's still going to be sin that comes. There's still going to be rebellion. And uh, that's interesting because you would think, how could they do that? How could they rebel against God when he's right there? But it demonstrates the depths of our hearts. And by the way, Satan's going to be bound during that time. So they won't be able to do the Flip Wilson thing and say the devil made me do it. It's going to indicate just how corrupt and how evil the human heart is. And wasn't it Abraham who, um, in Luke chapter 19, when the, um, when the rich man was begging, please send somebody back to tell my brothers because they don't know what's ahead for them. And somebody's got to tell them, here I am in, in torment in Sheol, Hades, and, and uh, tell them, have somebody go back. And Abraham said, you know what? They have the word of God. They had the prophets. And there was like, no, but send somebody back from the dead. That'll help. And Abraham said, they wouldn't believe even if somebody came back from the dead. By the way, Jesus came back from the dead. And there's billions of people who don't believe. And so that was an accurate thing. And even with the presence of Jesus there, they may not believe. Well, just briefly, some of the characteristics of the kingdom is that uh, there will be worship that goes on there. Isaiah 66, Ezekiel 40 through 46, all of that tells you the temple is going to be involved. There's going to be the practice of sacrifices going on, but they're not for salvation like it had been in the past for the nation of Israel. It's as a memorial, and they're going to be pointing to what Jesus Christ has done and the victory that they have won through that. There's going to be lots of activity. People are going to work. Uh, they're going to be doing their normal things. There will be family life. There will be relationships. Uh, I wrote a note to myself that it'll be good times. That's what it's going to be. And that I've often kind of in my mind just had a lot of fun with um, talking about some of the commercials that you'll see on TV, you know, and uh, just start making up commercials about pointing to Jesus and stuff. And uh, you know, Jesus, the breakfast of champ. I don't know what it'll be, but um, there'll be lots of fun things. So lots of stuff will be going on. Spiritual work will be being done, even though some secretly in their hearts will rebel. And Isaiah also points out that some who rebel openly at that time will, be, uh, will die and, uh, and will hasten that for them. It's going to be a time of peace and prosperity. It is exactly what all of us are longing for. And... There'll be a central form of government. Christ will be king without any doubt. David will be on his throne. And, and it will be a theocracy of the highest degree. And I am suggesting that man has longed for a one world government ever since he was created. The problem is we wanted to kick Jesus off the throne and put us on the throne instead. And, uh, but in this case, uh, Jesus will be the one who will rule. Well, what do we know about what's coming up there? We know that Christ will rule supreme. I also know that that day of the kingdom is at least seven years away from now, at least. It could very easily be longer than that. But the point for you and I is that we are prepared today to stand before Jesus Christ and that we are doing everything we can possibly do to prepare other people to stand before Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, how we thank you for the precious word of God that you give to us that helps us to understand who you are and what you have for us in this life and the life to come. Oh Lord, we grieve for those who do not know you and it is our responsibility to make it clear and plain who you are and what you have done. You have done a gracious, wonderful work on our behalf, and you have paid for the sins of the world, um, all of the world. And it is our responsibility to take your message to all this world. God, until the day you come, may we be found faithful serving you and bring glory to your name. In Christ we ask, amen.